Well, good morning. Appreciate so much uh, all those who have helped lead us this morning, especially Jeremy's thoughts at the table. He made me think back and remember a time as he talked about the power of the Lord's Supper. Um, when I lived in Memphis, Tennessee for a couple of years, uh, many years ago, and the congregation that we were a part of at the time asked me and some other college guys to uh, take communion to the local VA hospital. There was a large VA hospital in Memphis, and uh, that was a bit intimidating for me in those years, and so I sort of hesitated to go, and I went, and, but I soon found out just exactly what Jeremy was saying. Um, these guys that were in the hospital had been there for 30 or 40 years. They had been seriously wounded in Korea or in Vietnam. They didn't go any place, hadn't been any place, for 30 or 40 years except those rooms because they had been so critically wounded. And that moment of communion was highlight of their week. And it's so easy for us who are blessed with health and, and a place to, to assemble uh, to take it for granted, isn't it? Each, each week we just get it, you know. Uh, but for them, that was such a powerful moment. Thank you for reminding us of that this morning. Peter Drucker was probably the most famous, most accomplished business consultant of all time. He died in 2005, very influential in business circles. He wrote nearly 40 books, and, and he was sort of known for his wise sayings, and, uh, and many of them are remembered and quoted to this day. I want to relate one of his famous sayings as we start today and, and sort of baptize it. Uh, we baptize things around here. And, and use it to help us think about a spiritual truth. But Drucker was asked one time, what are the most important questions an organization can ask? And his answer was typically short, to the point, and smart. He said, every organization should ask just two questions. First, what's your business? And second, how's business? And I believe he was right. So what's our business? What is the business of the church? I am convinced and convicted that the business of the church is making disciples. Why do I believe that? Because I heard it at a lectureship or, or read it in a book? No, unless that book, of course, is this book. Uh, Jesus is the one who taught me this. Matthew 28, verse 19, the Lord said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Those are his last words to the disciples that he trained before he left the earth and ascended to the right hand of God on high. And so that's good enough for me um, to believe that our business in the church is making disciples. We are in the disciple-making business. So I just want to ask us this morning... How's business? Now notice that I didn't say that our business was baptizing. That may sound like a strange thing for a Church of Christ preacher to say, but I'm just quoting the one that we're named after. I'm just quoting the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He did not say go baptize people. Now as you well know, he goes on in verse 19 and tells us what we eventually do with disciples. We indeed baptize them. And 
and we teach them to observe all things Jesus commanded. That's what he said, right? So all people who are becoming like Jesus, and that's, we'll get to it in a minute, that's our simple definition of a disciple. All people who are becoming like Jesus are eventually baptized. And in fact, they are not right with God, not forgiven of their sins, not washed in the blood of Jesus until they are baptized. Amen? Amen. Okay. But you see, when we first start working with a person, when we first start influencing them, first start helping them become like Jesus, it does no good to dunk them in a baptistry until they understand the need to do that. Correct? All right. So yes, all true disciples will eventually be baptized. But the business of the church is to make disciples. How's business? And then after they're baptized, they still need to become more like Jesus. Correct? They still need discipled. Part of our problem in the church throughout history is thinking that once we get them immersed, they're good to go and we can move on to the next candidate. But I've been a Christian for now over 39 years and I still need to become more like Jesus. Just ask my girls and my dogs. They'll tell you. I still need to be discipled. Discipleship is a lifelong process. And you see, churches can get discouraged when they don't see consistent baptisms, when they don't seem to use their baptistry much. I know a lot of churches discouraged in that. But instead, we ought to be concerned when no one is becoming more like Jesus. That is when we're not making disciples. Our business is making disciples. How's business? Now, why are we in the business of making disciples? Because Jesus commissioned us to do it. Why did he do that? Well, that could be a long series of sermons, but I'll refer you to one verse, John 3:16. It's famous, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son because God so loved the world. What did his son do in the world? Well, a big part of what he did was make disciples. He called them. He walked with them, he talked with them, he trained them, he rebuked them, he showed them a good example, showed them how to do things, he sent them on missions, and on and on we could go for three, three and a half years, he worked with them. Jesus made disciples. You see, he, he never asks us to do anything that he didn't do first. So it's not surprising that just before he leaves the world, he says to, to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The business of disciples of Jesus is making disciples. How's business? Now, we can learn a lot about discipleship and discipling from Paul's letters, particularly to Timothy. Timothy was a minister younger than he was that Paul loved and discipled. Paul calls Timothy my true child in the faith. If you look at the uh, first letter that he wrote to Timothy, he calls him my true child in the faith. He, 
He again calls him my child in verse 18 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. And just sort of surveying some of the ways he, he, he refers to Timothy in the second letter, in the opening verses again, Paul calls Timothy my beloved child. He, he tells him soon after that, he thanks God for him, that he prays for him constantly. Chapter 2, verse 1 of the second letter, he calls him again, my child. Chapter 4, verse 9, he expresses his desire that Timothy come visit him. Paul is in prison at the time. He asked Tim, Timothy to come see him. So you've got this great relationship between Paul and Timothy that's an example of what we're talking about. And even outside of the letters that he wrote personally to Timothy, we have references to him. There's this one in the, the letter to the Philippians, uh, book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. Listen to what Paul said of this young man. He said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Paul says, I don't have anybody like Timothy. To the Corinthians, Paul calls Timothy my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17. And then if you just look at all the, the letters Paul wrote, several of them, Timothy is a co-writer. Just look at the opening words of several of Paul's letters. So they have this unique relationship, this bond the special tie, and it was certainly based on their love for one another. It was forged through the work of discipleship. Paul discipled Timothy, and I'm sure as time went on, Timothy discipled Paul. But what does that mean? What is a disciple? And what does it mean to disciple someone? Before we give a more specific answer, let me say this. Our churches, and by that I mean the churches of Christ in the Roman 16, 16 sense, they have had a, a troubling modern history at least, of discipleship. There was a discipling movement that arose within our ranks in the 60s and 70s that was an aberration. In fact, it became very much like a cult, and eventually it broke off and, and went its own way. Um, they're now known, for the most part, as International Churches of Christ. And they talked a lot about discipleship, and, and they practiced discipling, but it was in a very controlling, very legalistic way. And their ways, in fact, got them kicked off of a lot of major university campuses across the country, earned them a terrible reputation, didn't help our reputation, having been associated. Well, that kind of thing is not what I'm talking about when I talk about disciple and discipling. I've also noticed in more recent years increased talk of discipleship in our brotherhood. Uh, a lot of people are, are writing about it and, and conducting workshops and offering seminars and so forth on how to do it. The jury is still out, I believe, on these more modern discipling movements. I see some good things from them, and I see some possibly troubling things. 
things. So we'll see in time. I'm not talking about this more modern iteration of discipling. See, my fear is that, that we make discipleship and discipling too complex, too intricate, too programmed. I am not interested in a discipleship program that is more involved than the one that we see uh, Jesus conduct or that we see in the example of Paul and Timothy, for example not interested in anything other than that. You see, it is not hard at all to define what a disciple is. And it's not all that complex to describe how one goes about discipling another person. It's actually quite simple. It's, it's so simple, in fact, that if you go about it this way, no one is likely to ask you to write a book about it or, or uh, you know, the book's already been written, you see. And it's so obvious that you probably won't get invited to a national conference to speak about it and you won't be able to fill your schedule conducting seminars demonstrating how to do discipleship. I am suspicious when people try to make the Bible more complex than it actually is, that's just me. Okay? What is a disciple? Simple definition. A disciple is a person who is becoming like Jesus. Can you remember that? A disciple is a person who is becoming like Jesus. What does it mean to disciple someone? Again, simple. It means to help someone become more like Jesus. This is tough stuff, isn't it? A disciple is somebody becoming more like Jesus, and to disciple is to help someone become more like Jesus. And what I am saying this morning brothers and sisters, is that we need to start finding a way of evaluating our effectiveness as churches and as Christians by Jesus' standards. We need to retrain our church minds in this. Not how many baptisms we've had, not how many were at church, in the building, between the walls, on Sunday, not how many programs are running, not how good the music is, none of those things. The question is, how many are becoming more like Jesus? How many disciples are being made? How many people am I discipling? This is our business. How's business? See, Paul was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He refers him to himself that way several times. Sometimes he calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ, sometimes a disciple. Did Paul have anybody he was discipling? Anybody he was helping become more like Jesus? Well, of course. None more prominent in the New Testament than Timothy. Why did he spend so much time on Timothy? Well, because he loved Timothy. Love and discipleship go hand in hand. Why don't you just look at a couple of more passages with me related to this discipling relationship between Paul and Timothy. If you look there in the second letter to Timothy again, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I just want you to hear Paul as he reflects on his relationship with this, with this young man. 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. He says, you, however, and when he says you, he's talking Timothy. 
You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you, if you look at those words just in the context of, of what we're talking about, every word drips with discipleship. Every single word. Sort of like Paul saying, here, Timothy, here's what it's like to be more like Jesus. You, you've watched me do it, now you go do it. 2 Timothy is the last book Paul wrote soon after he was killed. And he says to Timothy, you've watched how I did it, now you go do it. That's discipling. And then back up one chapter to chapter 2. Right at the beginning of 2 Timothy 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus... And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What is Paul calling Timothy to do? Well, it's the very same thing that Jesus called all of us to do in Matthew 28, verse 19. Make disciples. Our business is making disciples. How's business? Now, discipleship is obviously a big topic. We've just barely scratched the surface, defined a couple terms today. But it's really not complex. It's not hard to understand. There are a lot of things to do but they're, they're all the things that we read in the scriptures about what it means to be godly and what it means to become more like Jesus. Things like studying the word of God and praying and worshiping and serving. The list goes on. That's the stuff of discipleship. The question is, are we helping others do this? Am I helping anybody do these things? If I ask you today, who are you discipling? Does a face come to mind? And if I ask you, who's discipling you? Who do you think of that's helping you to become more like Jesus? That's our business. As disciples of Christ and as a church, that's our business. And I ask you one more time, how's business? Let's pray. Loving God, on this your day, we thank you for the blessings, being able to be here, of seeing people that we love. Help us, Father, to think about the commission you gave us through your Son and how we are fulfilling it. Help us to do all we can to help others be more like Jesus and Help us to appreciate those who are helping us become more like Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us, for his life, his teaching, his sacrifice. We thank you that you brought him forth from the tomb and that we get to serve him until he returns. Thank you for hearing us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen.
As we conclude this morning, I ask you to remember these simple ideas. A disciple is somebody becoming like Jesus. There comes a point in our becoming like Jesus where we understand what he wants from us, and we say, yes, I'll do that. I'll do whatever you ask. One of the things he said is, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Maybe today for you is the day for that to happen. We would rejoice in that. But we want to be rejoicing that people are becoming more like Jesus. And we want to be a part of that, you see. So if we can pray with you, encourage you in that, whatever, don't let this opportunity pass without making a change. If we can help you, please come while we stand, while we sing this song.